Right, this um, lecture follows along with um, chapter, I believe it's 17 in your textbook, Shoulder and Arm. So there's quite a large amount of material in this chapter. So I've picked out the stuff that I um, feel like is most important. If you have questions on it, reference the chapter and see if you can get some background information to help you. Otherwise, um, you might have to visit with me if you're not quite understanding the material, but make sure that you've looked in the book um, first. So um, to, first of all, to function normally, the shoulder needs to have stability, muscular strength, um, scapular muscular strength, and a balance within forced couples. And we'll talk about what those are. But posture is also an important factor, and we'll discuss what kind of postures um, can lead to what sites, sorts of um, disorders in the shoulder. To start off with, uh, we'll look at um, just some general events that take place with the throwing mechanics. Um, the, the throwing mechanics um, from this text is divided up into four phases, and they're listed on your notes. The wind-up, cocking, acceleration, and follow-through. So um, on the picture to your far left here on the, the screen, the wind-up really involves minimal muscular activity. Um, when the arm is cocked back, we have a lot of anterior glenohumeral stress. Um, the deltoid is very active in this phase, bringing the arm up into abduction. Um, and extension, and then the supraspinatus and infraspinatus are active in that late cocking phase, particularly the infraspinatus um, as it brings the um, arm into external rotation. The third phase then moving on is acceleration. So you're bringing the arm forward, the serratus anterior and the pec major are really active in this phase. Um, also the lats and the subscapularis help with that internal rotation. Um, as you get part way through, um, then the throwing motion, we actually mo move into what's called the follow through. Um, and the muscles start working um, eccentrically to slow the arm down. And specifically the deltoids, the glenohumeral external rotators, which would be the um, infraspinatus and teres minor, and then the biceps. Those are all working eccentrically. So it's important to uh, strengthen the muscles concentrically, but um, especially those last um, four muscles during the follow-through phase, the deltoid, the external rotators, and the biceps need to be strengthened eccentrically. Um, the shoulder um, has really not a lot of stability. Um, there are two components that do provide stability to the shoulder. The first one is the static stability. It's provided through the capsule, the ligaments, and the labrum, uh, which you can kind of see a picture um, here. So we've got the capsule that surrounds the entire joint, the labrum, um, up around rimming the, um, the glenoid fossa, and, um, of course, the ligaments that are in around the tire joint. The dynamic stability is provided um, by muscles, particularly um, the rotator cuff. So you can see all four muscles here, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and then on the anterior portion of the scapula, the, infra, or the uh, subscapularis, excuse me. Um, and also then the biceps brachii helps provide um, stability. All of these muscles together will help um, kind of cuff in the um, shoulder, so the ball into the socket, and then keep the humeral head depressed within the glenoid fossa um, to keep it off of the top of the glenoid fossa and um, predisposing it to impingement. Scapula stability, the key muscles that um, we're going to be um, really interested in um, are strengthening of the middle trap. Um, so right through here in the lower trap, all right, keeping that scapula back and down. The serratus anterior, which you can kind of see in this picture, um, keeping that scapula snug up against the rib cage. And then the pec minor, um, which keeps that scapula depressed down. So, um, the scapula is the foundation of movement of your upper extremity. Um, so similar to the core um, for the lower extremity, the scapula is kind of the core of the upper extremity. Um, at the first 30 degrees of shoulder elevation, there really should be no scapular um, movement taking place. However, if we have an unstable scapula or weak scapula stabilizers, um, the glenohumeral joint will start moving and you'll see the scapula follow it. 
So um, right now I'm going to pull in a video um, to show you um, oops, scapular dyskinesis. And um, scapular dyskinesis is when um, the shoulder muscles, the, the muscles of the uh, scapula are not holding that scapula back and down against the rib cage, and we get excessive movement um, of the scapula. So we'll just let this play, and you'll be able to see it. I think he goes through this three times. Right there on the left, especially. So you can see how um, the scapula would wing way out. So um, if that is taking place on the scapula, the scapula really doesn't have a good foundation to work from. Um, so the other muscles um, have to work harder and from a poor postural um, situation, which can lead us to impingement. So um, with the unstable scapula or weak sta scapula stabilizers, the glenohumeral joint actually will migrate superiorly. So the glenoid head will migrate superiorly, and we can have pingement of the structures up here, which could include um, the bursa here. Um, if you happen to have bone spurs, um, it can be, become really irritated. And of course, the rotator cuff, um, specifically the supraspinatus tendon, and also the t um, long head tendon of the biceps um, can become impinged. Um, and painful. So scapular muscle strengthening has to begin really early in rehab and again, again when we're talking about scapular muscles we're talking about middle trap, lower trap, serratus anterior, um, pec minor which is, a, is tough to strengthen um, if, for the job that it does which is depression of the scapula. But that's what we're going to be focusing on. Um, on number four in your notes, it says scapula exercises begin early. You can do manual resistance. Um, and we'll have a picture here in a little bit of them doing manual resistance to the scapula. Biofeedback might be helpful. So biofeedback electrodes are put on the upper trap and maybe the lower trap. And the goal is to um, activate this electrode down here um, so that you'll, you'll see a graph and then that electrode um, will trigger a spike on the graph and we want to keep this relaxed. Um, so um, that's the use of biofeedback. The third option that might be helpful is taping. So we aren't we aren't really holding the scapula down. This is just a cue. Um, so the white tape goes on to protect the skin and then he's, his scapula is positioned in a really good position and then the brown tape is put on. Um, I actually would um, extend this a little bit further. You want the scapula, um, the tape to be um, part way on the scapula, but also off of the scapula, so that when the person goes into kind of a rounded forward shoulder position, they'll feel that um, pulling on the tape, and then it's just a cue or a reminder that they should um, retract the scapula back and down. Um, earlier, then, we alluded to some force couplings that need to take place in the shoulder. And the definition of a force coupling are two forces that act in um, opposite but parallel directions and they produce a rotary motion. Um, so if one muscle in a force couple overpowers another, then we can end up having some injuries. So we're really looking for balance between two groups of muscles that do opposite movements. So um, we'll talk about uh, three of them here. So in the glenohumeral um, joint force couplings. The first one is the infraspinatus and the teres minor. Um, and you can see the picture of those down here. And they'll perform glenohumeral external rotation. Okay, so we've got the, the humerus going into external rotation because of these muscles. And then um, the subscapularis is the force couple performs glenohumeral internal rotation. So pulling the humerus um, into internal rotation. So if we don't have a balance of these muscles um, and our subscap is a lot tighter um, and stronger than the infraspinatus and teres minor, um, then we start to have problems in either um, scapular, what we call dyskinesis, so the scapula isn't going to move right, or um, the shoulder isn't going to move um, biomechanically proper. Um, the second one is um, 
a rotator cuff, which um, perform, performs humeral head depression. So when the rotator cuff contracts, it actually pulls the humeral head inferior, okay? Um, and we, we couple that against the deltoids, which will um, perform humeral head elevation. So when the deltoids contract, it pulls the humeral head up into the glenoid fossa up that direction. So again, those have to be balanced and what we typically see is that the deltoids are much stronger than the rotator cuff and so the, the uh, humeral head ends up riding kind of high and again predisposing someone um, to impingement problems. Um, the last one is actually a scapular um, force couple. And for a scapular force couple, what we'll see is the um, trapezius and the serratus anterior um, performing an upward rotation um, of the scapula and the um, versus the rhomboids in the pec minor performing a downward rotation um, of the scapula. So um, typically we don't have um, a lot of... Um, strength in the mid-lower trap and the serratus anterior, that's where the weakness is typically found um, versus the rhomboids and the pecs. Um, but uh, again, we'll, we'll discover that kind of a mix of these muscles have to be worked um, as we move into rehab. Uh, now, we talked a little bit of this in the posture lecture, um, but remember that there is a posture-shoulder relationship and the cr correct posture is crucial to correct shoulder balance and function. So if we have a, a, a patient such as this that has a forward head posture, um, it'll tend to pull the shoulders into um, internal rotation and scapular protraction. So um, if you if you just sitting there roll your shoulders into internal rotation and protract your scapula, and um, then I want you to elevate your arm and note that it won't go as high as if you're um, externally rotated and your scapula are retracted and you'll be able to elevate your arm higher. And part of that is because the um, glenoid head will kind of hit up against the acromion um, or the greater tubercle actually can't clear um, the space underneath the glenoid um, or the acromion when it's in internal rotation but if you externally rotate it it can clear um, and and get right under the um, acromion you don't have an impingement so this kind of posture can actually predispose somebody to impingement um, and ro or more specifically a rotator cuff um, tendinopathy. So we have, um, in addition to this, we'll see um, short chest muscles, um, weak and stretched out back muscles that need to be addressed. Um, the, the section of notes below that say thoracic shoulder relationship. Um, just a few notes here that incomplete shoulder motion may be caused by a costothoracic joint or thoracic hypomobility. You can demonstrate this by going into kind of a slumped shoulder position so you increase your thoracic kyphosis and then bring your arm up into flexion noting how much flexion you can achieve um, versus going ahead and sit up with really good posture, retract your scapula back and down and then note how far up um, you can go into shoulder elevation. Um, so that um, we might have to work just on thoracic um, hypomobility even with somebody with a shoulder problem, so doing those PA mobilizations. Um, the costothoracic joint and thoracic spine hypomobility therefore limits trunk expansion, um, which is again necessary for shoulder elevation. So um, poor posture may be a con contributing factor um, to shoulder pain. Um, and so, like I said, you might be treating someone doing PAs or rib mobs, um, just kind of moving those so that we get more mobility out of the thoracic spine. Um, the picture you see here um, is um, a functional position or a plane of shoulder motion, and this is the motion called scaption. So if you take a plane that is um, right along the line of the scapula and extend that, um, that plane is called the scapular plane of, or scaption. So under number one, you want to put it's 30 degrees forward of the coronal plane. Um, is scaption. Um, the arm is in line with the scapula um, as it lies on the ribs. Number three, this is the most functional position of the rotator cuff. 
Um, a couple notes also about working with rehab. So we'll, we'll put patients in this position and have them work this plane of scaption. Um, we do flexion and abduction too, but scaption is really functional. So they'll do a lot of exercises in scaption. And then also to remember that when we start doing internal and external rotation exercises, that we'll put a roll between the arms and the ribs in order to um, keep that arm abducted a little bit. Um, and it just helps with blood supply to the muscles um, that are um, at the the working at the shoulder, um, primarily the rotator cuff, so we don't um, kind of squeeze or um, wring out some of the blood supply where we're doing rotation movements. All right, so moving into rehab techniques. Um, remember, we always start with flexibility. Just a couple notes to be careful. Um, of too much forceful overhead stretching. So you can imagine if somebody comes in post-surgically, um, they can't move their arm up over their head very far, um, and you give them the exercise. Um, I don't have, let's see if I can get a picture of it. Um, let's say that you, let's go back here, and um, you're going to have them do this exercise and with his um, right arm he's going to use the pulley and pull his left arm which we'll say was his surgery arm way up over his head and you have him do that um, uh, maybe 15 reps three times a day so you got 45 repetitions where he's pulling that arm up um, if he doesn't have a lot of motion under here and he's got weak rotator cuff then the head of the humerus will actually kind of ride high in um, the glenoid fossa and we can actually cause impingement of the shoulder. So we want to be careful um, of, of pushing um, flexion too much. Um, if they start getting a pinch um, or discomfort on top of the shoulder, then we, can, we have to back off. Um, in order to get our full... Um, abduction or full flexion we need to make sure that um, we have full external rotation so like right now I have um, an athlete I'm working with that's post-surgical and um, he's not allowed to go into more than um, 40 degrees of external rotation so um, in his rehab though we're, we're supposed to increase his flexion as well well he's not going to get full flexion until he's able to achieve um, fairly normal or near normal external rotation and if I would just really push on that and say oh we need to get to 180 degrees of flexion but you only have 40 degrees of external rotation I could certainly be setting him up um, f for impingement um, within the rehab time too all right, so passive range of motion um, exercises. Here we've got, this is called Codman's or the pendulum exercise. So the arm should be hanging freely and they move their body back and forth and the arm just kind of hangs there. Um, seated flexion. Um, right here if we have um, pulley system that can um, assist with passive range of motion given if they're given the instructions not to lift their arm using their other arm. Um, active assisted range of motion exercises are what we call wand exercises or um, I've got a, uh, an athlete right now that doesn't like me to call him the wand. He thinks that's too girly so I have to call them stick exercises. Um, but um, this isn't a great picture. It says it's for flexion and extension, but um, she's actually going into horizontal ab and adduction. Um, if the if the arms are coming up over her head, of course, that would be flexion. Um, and so she'll do most of the work and the support with a non-surgical arm. Let's say her left hasn't had surgery or right has. And um, she's using her left to do most of the work and the right would just be kind of going along for the ride. Um, you can do abduction um, in a similar way. Um, external rotation. Um, I actually like the picture on the um, bottom left better with somebody that's full surgical for external rotation. And then I suggest that you put a towel um, roll or prop underneath the elbow so that brings them into closer to the scaption plane. All right, and then let their elbow come out at about a 40 to 45 degree angle. Um, that gives them. It, just kind of loosens up the shoulder. Again, we're getting it into more of a loose pack position so that they're able to do um, some range of motion exercises without a lot of discomfort and actually see some success. 
And here's the um, wand internal rotation. Um, I think that the one on the right is actually more active assisted. Um, so the one that she's stretching, she's stretching the left arm as the right arm pulls up and brings the arm into internal rotation. Um, there is um, another stretch um, that's sometimes referred to as the cross-body horizontal adduction stretch. Um, so you might see this where they just um, bring the arm into a horizontal adduction and just hold it there um, as they're stretching out the posterior capsule. So that's another option um, for stretching. Now I don't have this in your notes, um, but oftentimes under active range of motion, um, players are given what's called a sleeper stretch. And um, we'll discuss this a little bit in, in class, but if you look, this is the position of the sleeper stretch. All right, and so they're sideline, and the arm's at 90 degrees, and they come across here and with their opposite arm, and they push this arm, so her right arm is going to be pushed into internal rotation. Um, now, it's interesting because if you, if you turn her um, like 90 degrees as if she's standing up, and you, and you look at her position, um, you would maybe recognize that this is actually a special test for rotator cuff impingement. It's the Hawkins-Kennedy test. And if you have um, rotator cuff impingement, this hurts. Um, so um, this actually is not a great way to do the sleeper stretch. Um, if they're having pain on the top of their shoulder um, because you're it's like you're repeating the Hawkins Kennedy stretch over and over and over and over and over again which is could cause again an impingement you're pinching the structures on the top of the shoulder so the sleeper stretch as it is here is um, is really not that productive um, what we'd want to do is drop the elbow down in this position a little bit. Um, so instead of abducted to 90, maybe to 70, uh, we're going to roll her more on her back to stabilize the scapula. And then we can push into rotation or internal rotation um, as long as the scapula is retracted, so depressed and, um, and retracted. Then we'll probably get a good stretch. And if you get in a good stretch, they'll feel it down the arm, so kind of in the, to the deltoids. But if they're doing it wrong, they're going to feel it up in the top of the uh, the shoulder and you you could actually be causing some irritation so make sure that you understand how to do the sleeper stretch the correct way we'll go over this a little bit in class too um, joint mobilization so general principles remember initial mobilization is performed in loose packed position which is 55 degrees of flexion and 20 to 30 degrees of horizontal abduction we've got a convex surface working on a concave um, surface, so um, our roll and the glide are going to be the opposite. Um, and then just precautions and contraindications, remember if we've got a hypermobile joint, so somebody that's really loose, um, I see this a lot more often in swimmers. When I worked outpatient, we'd have swimmers come in with real hypermobile joints or gymnasts. Um, that we have to be careful um, in our joint mobs that we don't we don't actually sublux somebody while they're laying on the table. Here's a picture um, of uh, just straight distraction. This feels great on somebody after their surgery. Um, just decreases the pressure at the glenohumeral joint. Um, there's another picture, another way of, of doing this. Uh, I'm actually doing this mobilization on an athlete right now that's post-surgical um, bank cart surgery. Um, if we do joint mobs, here's a couple pictures of inferior glide in order to get increased elevation or flexion, so we start in resting position. As she gains more flexion or abduction, we need to get her up into flexion and abduction and do the um, inferior glides in that position rather than staying down in the position on your left all the time. So that's how we progress that. Um, posterior glides, hope you remember posterior glides are in to increase um, internal rotation. Um, so. We've got um, a method um, there, just in the loose pack position, and then moving towards internal rotation, um, end range, and continuing to do the posterior glides. Anterior glides for more external rotation. Um, this is pretty close to um, loose pack position. All right. Um, in either of these, and as they gain more, you can bring the arm into abduction um, and more external rotation. And um, this would be maybe really 
beginning or post-surgical anterior glides, real controlled. Um, other joint mobilizations that um, you might see, and particularly post-surgical, if somebody's been in an airplane spent, splint for um, four to six weeks, um, their scapula might not be moving very well. So you can come in under the medial border of the scapula and um, distract that away from the rib cage and move it inferior and um, superior and um, also do rotations um, of the scapula. So it uh, might be an option that you need to utilize post-surgically. Um, scapular inferior glides, um, so they're just pushing, as you can see that her um, hand is just pushing this inferiorly uh, with some oscillations. Uh, you might want to do joint mobs at the AC um, joint, so just doing glides where the um, clavicle um, is moving back and forth, so anterior or posterior. Again, that's an accessory movement of shoulder elevation. We need to have the AC joint um, rotating. And then the sternoclavicular glides, again, you're on the clavicle doing, here the top picture is an inferior glide and then a posterior glide of the clavicle trying to encourage um, more movement when the shoulder goes up into elevation. Again, these are accessory movement joints. All right, as we move into um, the notes, I have self-mobilization. There's a glenohumeral inferior glide that I'll show you in class. Um, I think that we'll demonstrate this in probably the lab, so um, we'll skip over that right now. Uh, if we move into strengthening exercises, they can be used when shoulder mobility and strength are even limited. We can start with these. Uh, they're performed in a pain-free position in many angles. Um, the isometrics are held for 5 to 10 seconds. They're repeated at 10 reps, and then you move um, into the whatever you're trying to improve, what um, plane of motion. So if you're in flexion, then we move into 30 degrees of more flexion and do more um, isometrics there. So you can do in flexion, extension, internal rotation, external rotation, maybe pushing up against a wall, um, or manual resistance. This is just a picture of manual resistance to the scapula um, moving. Um, all right, we go into some um, isotonics, and we're going to hit on some of the muscles that are um, good and important scapula stabilizers. Um, so scapulothoracic exercises, we'll start them early. You can start them first, um, and then uh, we'll progress into some of the more distal um, or peripheral um, exercises. So um, TheraBand extensions, that would just be um, pulling back the, um, a TheraBand into extension, keeping the scapulas back and down. That is a constant um, reminder that you will be giving um, the patient as they go through these exercises. Uh, serratus anterior here, the person is punching up to the ceiling, um, and then the therapist is pushing down to provide um, some resistance. Um, push-ups with a plus, so they go into a push-up position. At the top of the push-up position, um, they will go into scapular protraction, then scapular retraction, and then down into a push-up, and then back up, and then scapular protraction and scapular retraction, and continuing those for strengthening the stratus anterior. Um, here's another one that you can do for the serratus anterior with rubber tubing. So they extend the arm out, and actually when the arm the elbow gets into extension, um, and they're going to just put a little more ump for push forward, like they're going to punch forward um, with the arm so the scapula comes into um, protraction and then slowly back into retraction and then bring the arm back to the start position. Uh, reverse flies could be a great exercise. Um, again, remember in this position that's posterior deltoids. If the thumbs are facing up, that's more middle trap. Um, and then if this, the arms are brought in closer to 135 degrees of abduction, um, we're working on the lower trap. Uh, seated rows, real common as long as they lead with the scapula. So I'll scapula back and down and then a row. Um, here's some exercises for scapula depressors. These are um, pretty good examples, the seated press-ups, um, and then bringing the TheraBand back and down. We talked about that um, prior to this, TheraBand extensions. Um, and then you can also have a strap coming around the shoulder, and you simply um, 
bring the scapula back and down from this position so you don't have any um, external forces that are clear out, uh, making the lever arm very long. Bowler exercises are exercises where um, the um, feet are up against the wall. Actually, I usually have them bring their feet um, four or five inches um, away from the wall. Arms go into um, full flexion. Um, and uh, the scapula, the person is instructed to keep your scapula back and down as much as possible. And you're going to position your hands first with your thumbs into the wall and you'll push back. And then you'll change, uh, maybe you would do five reps there. Then you put the backs of your hands into the wall and push back. Again, keep, try to keep the scapula back and down as much as possible. Then you bring your arms into more of a, um, I think your notes say a 45 degree angle. However, that's probably more of a 135 degree angle and the back of the hand pushes against the, um, the wall. Um, the instructions, keep the abs tight. Um, Heels are supposed to get against the wall, but oftentimes I have people with too much tightness um, in the shoulder that, that they can't even get their hands against the wall if their heels are there. So the heels, I start them out four or five inches from the wall. Elbows straight, and you're working with um, bringing the scapula back and down first. And then you can do some prone um, or physio ball exercises. Um, the YWT refers to the shape of the arm, so if this would be the Y position. Um, the arms are kind of at 135 degree, and then um, they can bring the arms straight out um, and then bend the elbows for a W, and then a T is um, like a, um, an iron cross bringing the arms back. And you lead with the shoulders, the scapulas, or the scapula, you, the scapula comes back and down, and then you lift um, the arms in whatever position you have them, the Y, the W, or the T. All right, the next um, slide here, I don't, you'll have to write these in. Um, this came out of an article that they, um, they tested a bunch of um, scapular muscles and doing different exercises and said, well, what are really the, the core exercises that need to be done to strengthen um, the scapular muscles? And so these were the four that they came up with. Um, scaption with the thumbs up. Um, so those of you that are familiar with empty cans, this is um, like an empty can, only the thumb is up, not down. All right. um, rows, um, a press-up or a push-up with a plus, we already talked about that, and then a press-up. And the press-up, um, I don't know if you remember seeing that, that was this picture right here. This is a press-up. And so they're coming up, and then they try to bring their scapula back and down while this in, is in this position. Okay, so those are considered the Mosley Scapula 4, very common, referred to oftentimes in lectures um, when um, athletic trainers or therapists are talking about uh, uh, scapular rehab. So um, what's really being strengthened here? So um, when the athlete goes into scaption with the thumbs up, that's a good supraspinatus strengthening exercise. They've actually found it was better than the thumbs down. Um, which is how we strength test um, the supraspinatus, that empty can test. Um, rows will be strengthening the rhomboids in the trap. Make sure they lead with the scapula. Uh, Push-ups with a plus, strengthening um, the uh, serratus anterior and the pec minor. Of course, other muscles, but we're more interested in what's going on at the scapula. And then the seated press up, the working the lower trap, the pec minor, and, and the lats. Um, there's been some discussion also of doing horizontal um, abduction um, when you're in external rotation, uh, working the infraspinatus, the posterior delts on the teres minor, and then a scaption with the thumbs down is a final progression, working the subscap deltoid and supraspinatus. Um, so, but the first four would definitely be ones that would be considered um, to, uh, good core stabilizers for the shoulder. So um, shoulder abduction and scapular plane, scaption, another picture of that. Um, another exercise could be external rotation that um, is utilized. Uh, that can be with TheraBand um, in different positions. It can be done with free weights if somebody's sideline. I like to start them in sideline. Um, towel roll underneath that elbow. Scapula, again, needs to be back and down the whole time that they're performing this exercise. Um, straight plane, external band um, exercises. Again, we've we've talked about this one. 
could even go into some um, some PNF exercises um, using the TheraBand, so diagonal plane exercises. Um, go in the other direction. Uh, some Swiss ball exercises as we progress the rehab. Um, so weight bearing through um, the Swiss ball and trying to um, stabilize the scapula, keeping the scapula again in a position that's retracted and depressed. Um, keeping the scapula retracted and de depressed while they do a weighted ball hold or using this as an adaptation of the body blade, the blade, um, they just kind of do the wiggles here while they try to keep their scapula back and down. And here she's trying to do the um, just some arm crawls um, with the scapula in a position where it is again retracted and depressed. PNF um, activities, um, you can do them in non-weight bearing or weight bearing. Um, Go ahead and progress into a quadrupt for some um, repeated isometrics. So just holding her there, and sometimes it's easier to move the body over the arm as a challenge instead of having her lay supine and moving the arm over the body. And again, here she's trying to hold um, some isometrics in a position while she just does um, a different activity. Um, with her upper and lower extremity, and then she added a TheraBand to make it uh, more difficult, so more resistance while she tries to stabilize the scapula back and down on that left side. And providing more of a challenge in these exercises here. Um, might be asked to do isokinetics um, for strengthening. That's really not real common, but occasionally that will come up. And some other exercises, the fitter board or balancing techniques. Um, this is a vibe board, so this actually vibrates um, while she's on there, trying to keep the scapula stabilized. Um, moving into plyometrics, um, so they um, come maybe from the ball down to the floor, um, or just trying to hold that while the ball moves around, or you're jump bringing the balls up off the floor. Here's some um, step blocks coming down and then coming back up on the step block. Um, weight bearing um, through the upper extremities while you're doing some movements. So on a treadmill. Um, I've actually seen this done in the clinic. Very difficult exercise. And then you can do medicine ball progressions. Um, starting supine um, and then throwing forward below 90 degrees and then over head so your arm is um, throwing above 90 degrees and then throwing backwards. Um, again you can progress this as far as need be depending on the person's sport um, or using the mirror for feedback so what she's going to be looking for is can she keep that scapula back and down while she does her, the functional activity of throwing um, where does that shoulder tend to hike up um, when she does this. All right, so that's it for um, this lecture. We'll go um, on to special rehab applications in class. Um, so if you understand these exercises, um, the lecture in class is going to be much easier uh, to go through when we start discussing um, shoulder instability and um, scapular strengthening and what we can do there.